Uh, hello! This will be a demonstration of Proposition 1 from Book 10 of Euclid's Elements, which says that if there be two unequal magnitudes, and if from the greater a part greater than its half be subtracted, and then from the remainder a part greater than its half be subtracted, and this be done enough times, then we will eventually reach some remaining magnitude which is less than the given lesser magnitude. All we're given are two unequal magnitudes, of course, of the same type. We're going to call them A, B, and C. And A, B will be the greater of the two of them. Uh, I will say for book 10, propositions about magnitudes, I will be drawing them out. But I will be drawing them out as straight lines. This is not to restrict these propositions just to straight lines, but because this book is so concerned with straight lines, I find it fitting to refer to all magnitudes or represent all magnitudes as straight lines, but just remember that this proposition would work for stuff like rectilineal angles, it would work for areas, it would work for solids, it would work for any two magnitudes of the same type that are comparable. So let's have some straight line A, B, or some magnitude uh, A, B, more realistically. And then we're going to have some lesser magnitude of the same type. We're going to call that C. So C here is obviously lesser than AB. So AB is the greater of these two unequal magnitudes. And then what we want to prove with this proposition is that if we cut off from AB a part greater than its half, and then from the remainder a part greater than its half, and if we do this enough times, then the remainder of AB will eventually exceed the given lesser magnitude C. Now, because AB and C are two magnitudes of the same type, then we know that there will be some multiple of the lesser magnitude C, which exceeds the greater magnitude AB. This we get from, at least in Euclid definition 5.4, which says that magnitudes have a ratio to one another when, which, when multiplied, are capable of exceeding each other. This is also said as the axiom of Archimedes for whatever reason that I'm not sure, but the point is that if you have two unequal magnitudes of the same type, of course, then there will be some multiple of the lesser magnitude that will exceed the greater magnitude. So what our first step is going to be is we're going to create the magnitude DE, which is the first such multiple of C, which exceeds AB. So let's call it quits there. We'll call the whole DE like that. Then, because DE is a multiple of C, we can then cut up DE into a number of parts, each of which is equal to C. So we're going to do exactly that. We're going to cut off df, fg, and the remainder ge, all of which will be equal to our given lesser magnitude c. Now, let me those off just so it's more clear what marks are divisions and what, what lines are marks of equality, just to make it clear. I'll do that in future propositions. Now, what we're going to do next is a little confusing, so I'll go through it slowly. What we're going to do is we're going to cut AB as many times as we have cut DE. So you notice that, at least in the case that Euclid deals with, uh, we've cut DE twice, but this proposition would work no matter how many times you cut DE. But the point is, we've just cut DE twice. This is the um, least non-trivial case to deal with. We're going to cut AB twice as well. We're going to have two divisions in AB, just as we had two divisions in DE. But, the, but these divisions will be a little bit different. They will be such that we cut off a part of AB that is greater than its half. So the first such part we'll say is BH. BH is greater than half of AB, and it will leave the magnitude AH as a remainder. Now, we're going to do this only one more time just because we only cut DE twice. So we're going to cut off from AH a part greater than its half, and we're going to call that HK. So HK is greater than the half of AH, and it's going to leave AK remaining. 
Now, what we want to prove from this is that AK is that magnitude which is less than the given lesser magnitude C. Now, since DE is greater than AB, that's how we made DE in our first step, and we know that EG is less than half of DE, because in this particular case, EG is a third of DE, so it's obviously less than half of DE. But on the contrary, when it comes to AB, BH is greater than the half of AB. So it follows from all three of these facts that DE is greater than AB, that from DE we've cut off EG less than its half, and from AB we've cut off BH greater than its half, it then follows that the remainder GD is greater than the remainder HA. Now, in a similar way, we're going to say that because GD is greater than HA, we have just proven that in our second step, then because GF, at least in this case, is, is equal to exactly half of GD, so you notice that GD here is twice of C, so GF is equal to C, so it is therefore half of GD, but the proposition would work if this wasn't the case. And HK, we know, is greater than half of HA, that's how we made HK. It then follows from this in a similar way as the second step by a property of magnitudes that the remainder DF is greater than the remainder AK. Now we know that DF is equal to C, that's how we made DF in our first step. So we can substitute this in by another property of magnitudes to say that C is greater than AK, or in other words, that AK is less than C, which is what we set out to prove. We set out to prove that if we cut parts off of the greater magnitude, which are greater than its half, we do this enough times, will eventually reach some magnitude which is greater than the lesser magnitude c. And we've just done that. We've reached a k, which has been cut off from a b in this way of cutting off parts greater than its half, and a k has been shown to be less than c. So a k being that magnitude which we set out to prove exists, we are therefore done with the proposition, therefore, etc., q, e, d. This is a very important proposition, which is why it's placed at the beginning of Book 10. Because although it is not used very much in Book 10, in fact, I believe it's only used in the next proposition, 10-2, it is nonetheless vital to Book 12, where we introduce something called the method of exhaustion. Now, I'm not going to go into exactly what the method of exhaustion is, but what it hinges on is the fact that if you have two unequal magnitudes, then you'll eventually be able to cut off from the greater magnitude a magnitude lesser than any other magnitude. Because C can be however short you want. The point is that you can cut off from AB a magnitude that is lesser than a magnitude that can be as short as you want it to be, or as short as it has to be. Um, this is fundamentally different from numbers, right? There's no proposition like this for numbers because magnitudes, unlike numbers, are continuous and are therefore infinitely divisible. With numbers, if you cut them up enough times, you'll eventually reach the unit where you won't be able to cut that anymore and still get another number. But with magnitudes, what book 10 is all about is the fact that there is no unit for magnitudes, that there are some incommensurable magnitudes, right? With numbers, they're all commensurable. All of numbers are commensurable according to the unit. That's what makes them numbers. But with magnitudes, this is not the case. There is no unit straight line. There is no unit angle. There is no unit area because there are these incommensurable magnitudes that no matter how small of a measure you get, they'll never have a common measure with other magnitudes of the same type. And that's what book 10 is all about. It's about commensurable and incommensurable magnitudes, rational and irrational straight lines and areas. And ultimately, what it's going to be about for us nowadays is irrational numbers, 
and most importantly, square roots and quadratics. Book 10 is very important, but it's also very hard. So I hope to do it justice with my series of videos because it's often overlooked. I mean, this is the first time I'm going through book 10 because when I learned it in high school, we only did the first six books. And then when I learned it, and then when I went through Euclid again for my college math class in freshman year, we didn't go through book 10 at all. We just did this first proposition, which makes sense. It's important because we had to do book 12. But book 10, it doesn't really get much love, even though it is incredibly important. So I hope with this series of videos to demonstrate its importance and why book 10 has to be so long. It's because its subject matter of incommensurable magnitudes is simply that important. It needs such an extensive treatment. Now, <laughs> I almost forgot to mention, there's a porism appended to this proposition. And it's very simple. It's simply that if instead of cutting off parts which are greater than the half of a magnitude, we cut off parts that are equal to the half, this proposition will still work the exact same. I'm not gonna go through that, but if you follow the logic out, it'll work. Um, and this porism is also gonna be quite important because sometimes we're not gonna want to subtract parts greater than the half, we're going to want to subtract parts exactly equal to the half. And this proposition still assures us that we can get a magnitude to be however small we want it to be and still lesser than any small magnitude before it. So that is proposition 10-1. Having nothing else to say about it, I'm going to end the video here and move on to proposition 10-2.